And the reason that he asked him was because he was wondering if he himself was called to the ministry, and he, he wanted to have some help. How can I know if I'm called to the ministry? So he, he asked this Lutheran chaplain in Vietnam, how did you know that you were being called to the ministry? What did the Lutheran chaplain answer? He responded that he looked around at his options and decided on the ministry because it was pretty easy and he felt that he could do it. Now, that is not the reason to become a minister. And it, unless you have a burning in your heart to preach the Word of God, to, to preach Christ's message that people need to, be he to hear, because the Bible says without a vision the people perish. And unless you have a, a sense that without people hearing the true Word of God, and being reconciled to that God by faith in Jesus Christ, they're going to perish throughout all of eternity, then don't go into the ministry. And if you're a woman, don't go into the ministry. You do not speak for, for Christ. Christ has not chosen women to speak for him. And that's why the man goes into the pulpit, the one who is called of God, not someone that, uh, that decides, well, hey, this is a pretty easy vocation. I think I can handle it. I'll go into it. But someone that's truly called of God with a burning desire to preach God's pure word and not just find a, a soapbox for his own ideas. Unless he's got that, he should stay out of the ministry. Brian, a lot of people have told me that they want to stay in a liberal church because they have a sincere desire to see the thing turned around. And, and if all the good people left, how could it ever turn around? You know, what, what, how would you answer a person like that? <clears throat> First of all, uh, your number one priority is for your family. And if you're exposing your family to satanic doctrine for this excuse that you have to stay in this God-hating, Christ-denying church, then you're wicked. And you're basically exposing your family to satanic doctrine. I want to read a passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 and following. I wrote unto you in the epistle not to, to keep company with fornicators, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or with extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must he needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or a covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. With such a one, no, not even to eat. For what have we to do, what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put yourself from among yourselves from that wicked person. In other words, when people claim to be Christians and they deny Christ, they deny the resurrection, they deny the word of God, <coughs> excuse me, they deny all these fundamental doctrines, the virgin birth, that Christ is the only way to God. When they deny these fundamental doctrines, they're idolaters, they're rank heathen, yet they're claiming to be Christians. They're claiming that name of Christ. Paul says, get out from among them. Don't even have lunch with such a person. So there is no excuse for you to be in a Christ-denying, God-hating liberal church. There's no mm. excuse at all. And if that passage isn't clear, here's another one. From 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14 and following. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now these people are unbelievers. They claim to be Christians, but they don't really believe in the Bible. They don't believe in Adam and Eve in, in Genesis. They don't believe in Noah. They don't believe in Christ as a virgin birth, and they don't believe all these fundamental doctrines. They're unbelievers. For what, hath fellowship, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he with a, that believe with an infidel, that is, with a heretic? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, Boy. saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean, and I will receive you. If you want to receive by God the Father, get out from those unclean idolaters, Christ-haters, Christ-deniers, pro-sodomite. These people hate Christianity. They hate Bible-believing Christians. And you know who they love? They love people who murder babies. They love abortionists. They love homosexuals. Homosexuals have anal sex with men. They're disgusting perverts. And that is, that's who they want to hang out with, is homosexuals and feminists and people who murder babies. Get out from among them. They're wicked, evil, satanic, and go to a fundamentalist church, a church that believes in the Word of God, that teaches the whole counsel of God, that believes in the literal 
Bible, the Word of God, and get out from that satanic nonsense. It's terrible, and uh, you got to get out. You know, uh, when what do we say when the person says, "Look, I was raised in this church, and I hear this often. My parents are members, and they'll never leave, and all my family keeps pressuring me to attend." and to have my children baptized or dedicated there, it would split my family if I left now. I even have a friend who visited a, uh, a Russian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox re church recently, and that church is satanic to the core, and he did it to please his parents, you know, kissing up to the parents. Now, is, isn't this a very dangerous idea to do this kind of stuff? Well, Brian, it is. As, as a matter of fact, the Bible calls it idolatry. And uh, you say, well, that's a very strong term, but let me read for you the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, if it's Christ's church, then his word ought to reign supreme. We ought to at least obey him. Okay, we call him Lord, and he says, why do, you, why do you call me Lord and you don't even do the things that I say? So listen to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says in Luke 14, verse 26, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And what Jesus is teaching is, if we love our father or our mother or our sister or our wife or our husband or our, our brother or, or some other relative more than Jesus Christ, that's idolatry. We're not worthy of Jesus Christ. That's what he's teaching. We are to love the Lord our God supremely. That's what the first commandment requires. That's what Jesus uh, taught when he gave the summary of the first table of the law, the first four commandments. And he said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. That is the summary of the first table of the law. And so if we <coughs> say, well, you know, how could I ever leave, uh, you know, first church over there? Our family's gone to it for generations, and I had a great uncle that was a pastor there, and, and uh, you know, it holds so many memories for us. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, one of my uh, grandparents uh, gave a large donation to have this building built, and there's even a plaque on the wall acknowledging his gift, and, and uh, it, our family has been a member of this church for generations. How could I ever leave? Let me remind you, if that is your attitude, then you love your family more than you love Jesus Christ, and that's idolatry. And the book of Revelation says that all idolaters will be excluded from heaven. They will have their place in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Stay in that church, but realize that you're an idolater and realize that you're, you're receiving your family and you're rejecting Christ and you're going to pay for that for all of eternity by being separated from the blessed Son of God uh, for all of eternity. And by the way, tonight if you will give us a call. Uh, we have a wonderful little book that we will offer to you, and this has some things that you will not learn in a liberal church. I guarantee it. As a matter of fact, if you go to a liberal church, I guarantee that your pastor does not want you to know what's in this book. I guarantee it, because there's things in this book that uh, are just a slap in the face of humanistic pride. But this book is called What is the Gospel? It's written by a great man of God, Lorraine Bettner. And uh, we have the privilege of uh, having offered it here on this program. Uh, we would be happy to send you your very own copy. And uh, it's a great little booklet. It's only 20 pages, but there's a lot of spiritual meat to chew on here. We'll, uh, Brian or I would be happy to send this book to you. Just give us a call. Brian, uh, sometimes uh, we hear people say, and, and the reason I wanted to ask you this question is because of uh, the church in which you grew up. But I've heard people say this. If your mother is deathly sick, you don't abandon her. Neither should you abandon the mother church. What does the Bible say about that sort of reasoning? Well, first of all, uh, the mother church is not, in this case, is not sick. The mother church is dead. And it's not a good analogy. Of course, you wouldn't want to abandon your mother who's sick. Uh, the Bible teaches that we ought to care for our parents, and uh, we ought to take special care for them when they're aged and sick and all that. But we're not dealing with a sick mother here. We're dealing with a church that takes the name of Jesus Christ, yet denies all the fundamental doctrines that you need to believe to be a Christian. So we're dealing with a church that is teaching blasphemy. Okay, this is not a neutral thing. You know, if the church does not accept the Bible as the Word of God, rejects the virgin birth, rejects the literal resurrection, rejects the divinity of Christ, rejects a literal Adam and Eve, and rejects Noah's Ark and all that, we're not talking about a sick church. 
we're talking about a dead church, and you're talking about a corpse, and you've got to get out, and you've got to become part of a church that believes in the true doctrines. That's a terrible analogy. You know, of course you have to take care of your sick mother. You know, I, I, here's another one I've heard. Are liberal churches really taking people to hell? Isn't it uncharitable to say that? Well, in, indeed they are, uh, Brian. As a matter of fact, uh, let, me, let me read from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, uh, ordinarily we don't think of uh, Roman Catholic churches as being liberal. But here is uh, from the 1994 Catechism of the Catholic Church, and it says this, Those who through no fault of their own do not know the gospel of Christ or his church, but who nevertheless seek God with a sincere heart, and moved by grace, try in their actions to do his will as they know it through the dictates of their conscience, these too may achieve eternal salvation. Now what is that saying? What that's saying is that there's the possibility of salvation apart from Jesus Christ. And that is wrong. That is dead wrong. That is heretical. That is false doctrine. And what that's going to do is make many people comfortable in their paganism. They're going to think, well, you know, even the Roman Catholic Church holds out the possibility that somehow I, being a sincere seeker and doing what I think is right in my own conscience, uh, that somehow I might be able to be saved by Christ too. That's, that's damnable. That's a damnable heresy. Jesus Christ said, I am the way. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the challenge for churches today is, are we going to remain faithful to what Jesus said, or are we going to bend over backwards to please all the liberals who want us to compromise everything that ch the church has ever stood for? Uh, Brian, what kind of a church should a person look for? You know, uh, so many people say, you know, there's so many denominations, there's so many competing claims. What should we look for? Well, I want you to, you know, when you check out a church, see if they have a statement of faith. You want to find out, number one, do they believe that the Bible is the infallible Word of God? Okay, and be specific. Say, do you believe that the Bible is infallible when it speaks about history, when it speaks about science? The Bible is infallible, and that is the foundation of Christianity, sola scriptura, the Bible alone. And if they don't accept the Bible, see, when wicked men say the Bible's full of mistakes, what they do is they place themselves as judges over the Bible. And then they become the ultimate authority, man, Sinful men become the authority over God's word. Mm. The Bible is infallible. Make sure they believe that. Make sure they believe in a literal Adam and Eve created by God in a literal six days, not ages, not billions of years or millions of years, but a six-day creationism. Adam and Eve, literal, created by God. They did not come from apes. Make sure they believe in Noah's Ark, a worldwide flood, that it literally happened, eight persons in the ark. Find out that they believe Jesus is truly God and truly man, that he literally rose from the dead, that he was truly born of a virgin. Okay? And find out. Ask your pastor. Say, well, who do you vote for? What is your political persuasion? If he votes liberal, if he votes for Democrat, if he's pro-abortion, if he's pro-sodomite, you've got a liberal. Get away. It's like leprosy. It's like cancer. Get away. You've got a liberal. They're bad, 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 bad. Get away. Terrible. So ask the right questions. Is the Bible the word of God? Does he believe in Jesus Christ? Justification by faith. Absolute predestination. These are other doctrines that are important. True worship of God. You need to find out. And give us a call and we'll send you a copy of that book by Lorraine Bettner, What is the Gospel? Really good book. <laughs>